Now, here's where CRA has, again, made this incredibly complicated for everybody. There's one sheet that says motor vehicle expenses. It looks really straightforward. And people fill it out and enter it and then follow through. That form is strictly for people who own a vehicle only for business, who have bought a car for the business and never use it for anything else, who have their own car for um, pleasure use. If you have this one, you will see, second line from the bottom, automobile expenses from the auto schedule. What the heck is that? Well, in a computer one, you click on that and it takes you to allowable automobile expenses. This is where you do your percentages. So you are able to put in the whole amount that you paid for all your auto expenses tell the program how many kilometers you drove for business, how many you drove for pleasure, what the percentage was, and it figures it out for you. If you don't, you have to use a calculator and figure it all out on your own. So you use this one if it's a car that you have used for personal and business. And then that all moves on to that first page of your return. There's also a page for capital cost allowance where you can figure all that out and get that done. Then that all transfers over to this. You have a page for, I have it somewhere here, you guys don't, uh, or some of you do, for your business use of home. Works the exact same way. You figure it all out, put in all your expenses for business use of home. And then that gets carried forward. And they all end up showing up on page two and then if you look at page two, it says, take this net number, so you've got your total income, you've figured out all your expenses, your car, your, co your uh, business use of home, your capital cost allowance, all your own personal ones, you come down to a net number, it all goes on the second page of your personal tax return as one number. When you are self-employed, uh, you are allowed to claim as an expense, if it's reasonable and if it makes sense to, to do so, your spouse or your children. Uh, you can have them work for you. So, because in any situation, especially in a spousal situation, the most important thing you want to make sure of when you're doing your tax returns together is that your incomes are as close to each other as possible. That will give you the best tax advantage. Having one person making $100,000 a year and having one of them making $20,000 a year, you are, spending, you are paying way too much money on the one person and the other person's does not equate to that amount. So the closer you can come with your incomes together, the better it is. You have a unique opportunity when you're self-employed because you can actually manipulate somewhat your expenses. So my example would be is if you're freelancing, and you are, and you have your own business, and you're making a fair bit of money at it, and you have a spouse that you're either, uh, that's either a full dependent or is not making very much money at all. Why not pay them to do some work for you? Pay them to do some research. Pay them to do some office work around the place for you. Um, it, it has to be re legitimate. You, you, you know, you can't make something up. They actually have to be able to do the work, and you actually have to pay them. You can't just say that you did at the end of the year. They need to give you an invoice, and you need to physically, if you have two different bank accounts, have them, write them a check, pay them to do, to do the work. And do it on a regular basis. You can't just throw in a lump sum at the end of the year and kind of say, well, that was it. They will have to, in turn, claim it on their tax return as income, but if you're getting, you know, it's, if it's allowing you to get a little bit closer together on the incomes, that works out well. Especially if they're, um, if you have a spouse that's not working at all, say if you've got children and one of, the, one of them, one of you is staying at home, and they have no income, they can earn up to ten thousand dollars from you, and pay no tax. So it's really well worth it when you're in a thirty percent tax bracket. You're talking about saving three thousand dollars a year right there. Anybody have student loans? Okay, and you know you can, hey, <laughs> and you know you can claim your student loan interest on your tax return. You do know that, right? Okay. Um, if you have a lot of other debt besides your student loan, you are almost better off paying off other debt first because interest on student loans is about the only interest that you're allowed to claim on your tax return. 
So you're better off just letting, if you have to let some interest accumulate, pick the student loan over the credit cards, over other things like that. Uh, because things like credit card debt, unless you have a credit card that's in your business name, you can't claim any of the interest on it. And then who is, uh, who is an artist as well. If you donate your artwork, you need to get a donation receipt for that. And you should be claiming, what you should be doing is claiming the amount of the donation as income on your business expenses, and then claiming the donation amount on your Schedule 9 donations. It, you actually get a, a, a better bang for your buck than just ignoring it completely. But you have to claim it as the income, and then you can claim a donation receipt for that. Yeah? Interning. Interning? Yeah. What about interning? Like, that, that's work, giving it Oh, now that's aid in kind. Oh. Now that's an interesting one too, and I will, I will talk about that for a minute, because that's a great one if you're working for not-for-profits. Um, if you go into a not-for-profit and they say, you know, you want to do a little work for them, I'm not sure if they take interning, but it's always worth asking. You cannot provide a service and receive a donation receipt. That's against the law. But what you can do is do what we call a check exchange. So what happens is, is that you come up to this not-for-profit and you say, I'm willing to, uh, we actually have a few people who do this, like graphic designers who will do for free or for at a very reduced rate, work for a not-for-profit. And what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to value this work I'm going to do for you at, say, $1,000. I will donate $1,000 to your cause. You pay me $1,000. So it's even. They haven't, they're not out of pocket in any way, but you get to have a donation receipt for your cash donation that you made. And you can claim that. Any donations that you make up to $200 in a year, you get, what is it? You get 15.25% return on that. Okay? If you have donations worth more than $200, $200, every dollar over $200, you get a tax credit of 39%, 29%. You can carry forward donations for five years. So if you donate regularly, but not, you know, maybe just a couple of hundred a year, you are really better off hanging on to those donation receipts till the last year that you can claim them, and then lumping a whole bunch of them together and throwing them all in at once. I often have people uh, coming to me after five or ten years and, you know, the expression like coming in out of the cold. When people come to me and say, okay, you know what, I haven't filed my taxes in ten years. And uh, suddenly I want stuff. Suddenly I'm, you know, I was going along for a while and it was fabulous and I was, you know, I was living, you know, the sort of bohemian lifestyle and under the radar and, and off the grid and all that. And then I wanted a loan because I wanted to buy some more stuff. And then I wanted a house because I got married. And then suddenly, like, banks and, and everyone is just going, can't help you. You have no records. You, we don't know anything about you. Um, so it, it seems sometimes to a lot of people like it's a good idea to just not, you know, I'm not really making that much. I don't need to file a tax return. Um, but eventually you kind of do need to start thinking about doing that. And uh, you don't want to ever have a situation where they're going back you know, you're either in a situation where you can't get the loan, you can't get the mortgage, no one's taking you seriously because they have no idea how much money you've been making. And you also don't want a situation where uh, you ever have Canada Revenue Agency coming after you and looking in your stuff. You want to make sure that when you are filing your tax returns, that everything is really clear for them, that you've been organized, that you have all your receipts available, um, a lot of people are doing now these things like the scanning receipts and photocopying receipts because um, it's the new laser printers that they're using for receipts. They fade. And they can fade within a year. So uh, a lot of people are just taking, say, like, you know, if they've got all their receipts together for, say, gas, taking them and actually going to the trouble of photocopying them all, like on one or two sheets and having those so that they have them, or scanning them and saving them so that they have those available. Can yeah. you, you absolutely can. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of my spiel. So does anybody have any general questions or anything I didn't cover? Uh, yep. What if a freelance, no, sorry. Uh-huh. 
you can you can claim it. You just need to be you need to prorate it to the amount that you use it. And you can, you have to do that with the capital cost loans as well. So if you bought a computer for five for a thousand, sorry, two thousand, uh, and you use it about half for business, then in the first year you want to just claim the thousand and then work down from there. But yeah, you can use all that. Talk a little bit about foreign income. Foreign income? Yeah, working out, working out of country. There isn't. Are you out of the country physically for yeah. uh, how uh, more than 183 days in the year? Yeah. yeah? Um, if most of your income, if you're physically out of Canada for more than 183 days, technically you don't have to file a Canadian income tax return. Uh, having said that, I probably would do so anyway because it can get, again, it can get kind of dicey. I mean, have you, because you don't sever ties with Canada, right? No. You just travel a lot for business uh, like to different ten, places. You know, as much as 10 months a year. Um, as much as 10 months a year. I would, I, there's nothing special about it. You just claim it, claim it as you normally would. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing, again, just the exchange. I'm just wondering about, um, for, for when a lot of people ask for the answers for the business. Mm. Yeah. Well, if you're talking about registering a business, um, there's basically, the, you know, you're talking sort of about three different levels of government here. If you're going to go in and sort of register a, a business with a city and have a business license, which you would need to do if you're seeing clients in your home or if you have an office space that you're, that you're working in and seeing clients, you need to register your business with the city. And you will have a name for that business. But that's, that is only recognized in the city of Vancouver. The next, and, and the federal government, with your taxes, couldn't care less whether you're registered as a business or not. If you were really, really iffy on whether you were having a business, if you had a business or a hobby, it might be one of those things that would lean you more towards a legitimate business. Um, but they don't, they, they would never disallow all your business expenses just because you hadn't registered with the city. Okay, so there's that level of it. Now, the provincial level is actually registering as a corporation. And in this case, then, you would actually have a, business, a registered business name that would be yours and yours alone in British Columbia. So nobody else in BC could ever have that name. And they actually have to do a name search for you and all that. Now, that's going into incorporation. And really, you would have to be making, I say like around seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. You might want to start thinking about net income. You might want to start thinking about incorporating yourself. But it's a fairly lengthy process and it's, it's complicated and taxes become a lot more complicated. So unless you really, really got to that point, I wouldn't bother with that. I just want to mention this one other thing too, because many people come to me and they're in panic because the year, end of the year came, we filed the tax returns and they call me up and they say, Mariana, I got told I have to send in all my receipts for medical or my donation or my tuition or whatever. Because most people e-file now, uh, and CRA doesn't see the hard copies of everything that they used to be able to see, they will every year pick one thing and just pick thousands of people and just say, send in your donation receipts. Or send in your tuition receipts. We want to see the, the actuals. So that's happening, almost, that's happening every year now. So it's not an audit, and you don't panic. If they just want one, it's just because they haven't seen them in a while and they just kind of want to. I mean, the most important thing though is be organized. I can't stress it enough. If you're not organized, they assume you're trying to hide something. And then they start really digging. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Marianne Scott of Quantum Accounting Services, thank you so much. She's got yeah. cards up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aww, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, you're very welcome. Thank you.